we're going to pray here in just a moment. But again, I'm thrilled for the opportunity uh, to once again be in the house of the Lord. I'm glad you're here. Uh, thanks to the youth group for letting us share your space tonight. I know this is normally your time. Uh, but hey, thanks for uh, giving us the hand of fellowship this evening to spend time with you. It's going to be good, I promise. Let's talk to Jesus. Uh, Lord God, I love you, and I thank you, and I honor you, and I pray that tonight you would speak to our hearts, Lord, that you would take this time to give us understanding, clarity, motivation to a deeper and more beautiful relationship with you. I bind the attacks of the enemy right now as your servant, in your name, Jesus, that they would be unsuccessful. And I pray, Lord, that you would grow us into being a people that are watchful, careful, prepared for everything that's coming. We give you honor, we give you glory, and it is in your name, Jesus, my Lord, my love, and my God, I say amen. 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 So tonight, the title of my sermon is Keeping the Fire keeping the fire burning. We're going to have some time together this week. I hope you will not miss any of our services. I'm looking forward to each one of them. We're going to emphasize the Holy Spirit as I minister to you on bearing the Holy Spirit, something that the Lord has shown me uh, that is was really neat to me anyway, um, that we can actually be preemptive with the gifts that God has given us. Uh, a lot of times in Pentecostal circles, we tend to be a people of spontaneity. Uh, we tend to believe that only in this, this kind of chaotic moment can God bring a tongue and an interpretation and a prophecy and all this kind of stuff. Um, I've come to understand that God is, is pretty prepared for stuff, um, that he knows what's coming, and that it will soften our hearts and our persons in his presence. He will encourage us with gifts from the Spirit that are given before they are even necessarily to be delivered. I can't wait to share this with you. It's really good. We're going to spend some time talking about divine healing and some things I've come to understand. I'll recount some stories of healing um, that we've seen overseas. I've seen dead people raised back to life. I've seen blind eyes opened. I've seen deaf ears healed. I've been present when God has done all these spectacular things. Not my fault, his fault, but I've been there to observe and to apply faith to the needs that were present. So we're going to talk about healing one night, and then I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you to be a force to be reckoned with in this community and to the communities that surround us. Uh, I'm going to challenge you to take the gospel forward. But first, tonight, uh, this morning was a wonderful time. We shared testimony, and I hope we were all encouraged with the greatness of our God and, and his capacity to be able to do anything. Uh, but tonight, I want to take a little bit of time and talk to you about the value, everybody say value. 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 The value of investing yourself into this relationship with God and the value of investing yourself into being prepared. So many times, life just catches us off guard. You, I've seen so many Christian lives that they're just motoring along All's well, they watched a TV program that told them since they got saved, nothing bad was ever going to happen. Well, then something bad happened, and the next thing you know, they're reeling. Yeah. And uh, they take forever to recover, if they recover at all, in their walk with Jesus. Uh, tonight, I want to, to encourage you in a couple things. Number one, life is broken. Life is broken. If things are not as they should be. There is sickness. There is poverty. There is death, there is affliction, there is violence. We live in a world that has been tainted by sin, by the disobedience of man. And as a result, we are going to face these things, Christian and unchristian life. What does the Bible say? It rains on the just and it rains on the unjust. God is not a respecter of persons. We recognize that there is just this reality we live in. As long as we're here, there's going to be tough times, okay? It uh, doesn't mean you're being punished by God necessarily when something rough happens. It just means life is raising its head and the stuff that happens is happening, okay? So I want you to come away understanding life is broken and we need to be ready for that. Number two, I want you to come away recognizing that there is an entity that genuinely wants to kill you. 
That's right. I, I don't want you to miss this. There is a supernatural entity, Lucifer, Beelzebub, Satan, whatever you want to call him, a pre-existent entity to man that desperately wants to kill you. He wants to harm you. He will position himself to harm you. I need you to get this into your spirit. Because if you don't understand that life is broken and rough stuff happens sometimes, and you don't understand that there is an entity that desperately wants to take your life away, you are not going to see a value in being ready. Right. Tonight, we're going to talk about keeping the fires burning and why that's important. I want you to consider the importance of making sure those fires stay lit. Now, what do I mean when I mean fire? Do I mean all of you should go set yourself on fire? No, bad idea. Bad idea. Okay. Take it from me. Bad idea. Although it was an enlightening experience, bad idea. People are like, hey, hot enough for you? I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm not burning. It's okay. <laughs> The fire I'm talking about is the, the kindled readiness, the fire of readiness. Uh, if you read old time stories, Louis L'Amour books, I don't know if you like Western stories, if you like stories of the Old West, you'll read about how they would set a watch fire to keep the, the wolves and the predators at bay. Uh, you think, well, that's an ancient practice. No, it's actually still a common practice. When we're in Africa, well, part of our ministry is we go where nobody's ever gone before. I, I cut a, a trail into the bush where nobody's ever been, and I go to people that have never heard the name of Jesus, not even as a cuss word. We'll spend weeks at a time, see hundreds of people make a decision for Jesus, and they will have been told for the very first time that there is a God, he loves them, and he made a way for a relationship through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. Super awesome to be a part of that. But there is a reality when we're doing this ministry, and I'm not being evangelistic here. I'm not uh, trying to drum up uh, the severity of what we do. There are animals that want to eat us. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had lions attack our camp. Uh, we've had elephants that have threatened to come through and stampede us. I've had a, a leopard actively hunt me to consume me. God provided a way of escape. But the chiefest, listen, the chiefest of preventions to these things that want to harm me is to make sure the fires burn. <laughs> because fire inherently is a threat to predators. Oh, this is going to get your spirit, I promise. <laughs> a lit fire is a threat to predators. A readiness is a threat to aggressors. Mm -hmm. When we're overseas, there was a night we were camped out. There were lions in the bush. The fires went down. Chaos ensued. We nearly had a guard eaten. The Lord orchestrated a series of events. Happened to my mom and dad. They can tell the story much better than I. But it ended with the fires not burning. Dad having to make his way to the Land Cruiser, whereby he tried to run over the lions, which I wholeheartedly support in that moment. <laughs> And a lesson was learned by all. Keep the fires burning. burning. Because fires are a deterrent to enemies. It says this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, beginning, humble yourselves, therefore, into the mighty hand of God, that at the proper time he might exalt you casting all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. Look, be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to kill. 
That's to right. consume, to devour the scripture. Says here. Look, it says resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who's called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Look, it's what it's saying. It says, look, God has a plan. He's going to rescue all of us. He's going to pull his children into his presence where there will be no fear, there will be no threat, there will be no tears, there will be no pain, there Amen. will be no suffering. Amen. But until then, you got this enemy, you got this, this, this threat that is kept at bay only by vigilance, being watchful, being sober-minded, keeping the fires burning. It is what we're called to do, that we may survive the onslaught of the enemy. It's a matter of being prepared and watching over the preparedness of our person regarding what we know is going to come. Look, none of you should be surprised if one day the scan comes back that there's a mass. I know that's what happened to me. Everything was going along fine, just married for two months, enjoying the wonders of discovery in a fresh relationship. It was awesome until I was having trouble breathing. And it wasn't just because my wife was taking my breath away, which she does. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> I, I hear you concurring. I'm not sure how you know. We can talk about that later. <laughs> But it was at that time that I started struggling to breathe. I went in. I had a 22-inch mass in my chest. Mm. Fully malignant with lymphoma cancer. Metastasized. In my guts. Growing at a half inch of mass a day. Should I be shocked? No. Why? Because there is an enemy. There is a threat. Mm. That is constantly. Mm. Constantly at our doorstep. And, and, and I wasn't rocked to the point of throwing up my faith and giving up because the fires were lit. Right. And so what did we do? We fought. And we resisted. And God delivered. That's such a long story. That's the synopsis. It's what you need to know. I'm still alive, I promise. <laughs> we have enemies... And we have tools that we've been given to resist these enemies. Amen. And these tools are specific to resisting certain enemies. God says, hey, here's this armor, this, this armor of faith. It's this armor of God. It comes with a shield. It comes with a breastplate, a helm, a waistcoat, and, and cool shoes, man. <laughs> And they're they specific in their service to us to, to help us resist this enemy. Why? Because we're supposed to be vigilant, sober-minded, recognizing there are threats and there are enemies that are coming. They're at the doorstep. The scripture says, behold, sin crouches at the door. Friend, I must have you understand we've got tools that have been given and that are efficient in, in resisting these enemies. What I... I mean is to consider what it means to live in a state of readiness. Now, I'm not saying being gloom and doom and being like, woe is me. Every day you step into school just knowing you're going to get shot. This is the day, I'm sure. <laughs> or every day you eat yesterday's leftover just knowing today's the day and I'm getting salmonella. <laughs> I'm not saying living in a negative heart and living in a negative spirit. I'm saying recognizing that life is broken. We have enemies and you've got to be ready. Right. Yep. And in that readiness, I find myself celebrating God that he has given me what I need to resist. Amen. I find myself in a greater state of joy because I know, come what may, I'm ready. Amen. We'll stand. We'll fight. God has given us the tools.
tools we need. Consider what has happened countless times in history by conquering kings. We have this story repeated hundreds of times through history. As many times as land has changed ownerships, I promise this story is in some way applicable. Time after time, conquerors have taken land and territory only to become comfortable and lax, essentially letting their fires go out. Mm. And eventually they're overthrown. Consider this. A young knight was something to prove. Powerful in battle, unmatched in skill, he establishes a kingdom, overthrows its rulers, and acquires the throne. There he lavishes in his accomplishments. Who would dare challenge him, he wonders, at his state of physical prowess and readiness. Surely none came. So he dined on the fat of his victories, and he himself slowly falls prey to the results of leisure, growing soft, slow, and unready. Essentially, the fires begin to die out. Imagine then that one day the horns of battle blow. Woo, here comes a challenger, incredulous at the notion of a usurper. He arises to meet the upstart and he calls for his royal armor and sword, only to discover he cannot fit all of himself into the armor that once fit so well. And it is rendered ineffective for him. So he says, surely I can depend on my my sword. But he, he realizes upon grasping it after so much time that it has become fragile and rusted and dull and is no longer a weapon fit for opposing a true enemy. He is beset upon by an enemy with no defense and no offense. And on that day, Another would sit on the throne. This friend is a real danger. We have seen this story repeated through history time and time and time again. The greatest conquerors and kings have eventually fallen victim by letting the fires And see, it's no different for you. We have been called in Christ to have a kingdom established in our hearts, in our persons. And we have become stewards of that territory, right? And so we watch over that territory, and at first when a a confession of faith is made, we watch and we're careful against enemies. We we make sure that no unclean thing is set before our eyes, so we don't even watch shows with with cuss words in it. We don't watch shows where they lie or they gossip or or there's any nudity at all. At first in our Christian walk, we we set these boundaries, and and we don't even let liquor in the house. No way, man. We're not even going to let the beer come through the door. We're going to stop it right there because this house is holy. Holy dog on it. <laughs> we set up rules. No smoking in the house. Got to be outside, if at all. And when we start making these decisions, we're going to consecrate this space. And this fire is burning in our chest. We watch the words that come out of our mouth, careful not to lie, to deceive, to gossip, and to do wrong to others. Careful that we don't let slip a blasphemy, something that would hurt the heart of God from our tongue. That new Christian, careful and zealous for the things of God, slowly, slowly the fire starts to die down. 
We start watching shows that have things no son of God or daughter of God should observe. And we start saying, well, the beer can come through the door. It's just not going to my lips. I guess the smoking can come in the house, but you know, we're just, I'm not going to partake. And maybe God's not going to mind it, just a little gossip, because I know it's true anyway. And that line moves back as the territory becomes threatened and the fire dwindles even more until it's not a big deal. Take the drink. It's not a big deal. Take the drag. It's not a big deal. Tell the lie. It's not a big deal. Watch the porn. You find yourself defenseless. And the enemy comes in and robs you of your faith. You say it's impossible. Friend, it is not. I have seen it happen time and time and time again. Keep the fires lit. Looking at that garbage on the internet, it's not cute. It's not harmless. Speaking those destructive words with your mouth against neighbor. It's not innocent, it's, it's murder. Letting the line fall back until you move from having a sip to being an alcoholic. It, it's, it's, not, it's not okay. And I'm not, I'm, not trying, I'm not trying to establish this ideal of what, what exactly is sin and what's not. Oh, brother, you know the Bible doesn't actually talk about that. But you're not saying that. <laughs> I'm saying it's a threat. And if you don't believe it's a threat, read the DUI list and the obits from people that got run over by drunks. Amen. Amen. We don't even have to take it onto the realm of being a sinner or not. We can just say it's not wise. And it's a threat and it causes kingdoms to be lost in the heart daily. That's right. Nobody can argue with that. Not really. Not really. Families are torn apart by porn every day. Men don't realize it. But with the sex trade in full effect, you don't understand this, but I want your heart to be understanding. If you click on an image, there are programs in place that see what color that person's hair is, boy or girl. What color their eye is, boy or girl. Boy or girl. How tall, how small, how wide, how thin. And it creates a profile of what is desirable. It's called consumerism. So when you click on those images, in a consumer society, you are creating a demand. A demand, in this case, that is met by human material. And so somebody's daughter, mother, sister, who fits that image becomes a target to meet a consumer demand in the sex trade. This is the truth. This is the truth. And somewhere along the lines, you got convinced it was innocent. Wasn't a big deal. Somewhere along the lines, we lose our understanding that there is a real entity that wants to kill us and there are real threats that will destroy us. And so, friend, I'm telling you, keep the fire lit. Keep the fire lit. The scripture tells us we must be in a state of preparedness even for the return of Christ. Amen. The scripture says this, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows even the angel of heaven nor the son, Matthew 24, 36, beginning. But the father only, for as they were in the days of Noah, so will it be in the coming of man. In those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. They were unaware till the flood or the judgment came. 
swept them all away. So, so, so will be the coming of the Son of Man when two men will be in the field. One will be taken, one will left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Or, or keep the fire lit, mm. <laughs> for you don't know the day that he's coming. What's the threat there, brother? The threat is getting left behind. Hello, Christian. Yeah. It's not where you want to be. Mm-hmm. But know this. If the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake. And he would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must have also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you don't expect. This is Jesus talking to us here. Who then is faithful and wise servant, whom his master has set out over his household to give them food at the proper time? Blessed is the servant whom his master will find doing correctly when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all of his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats with and drinks with the drunkards, and the master of that servant will come one a day when he does not expect it at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't know how to make it any clearer. Jesus is using very figurative language as he says, keep the fire lit. Be ready. Be prepared. Stoke your faith. Be in a state of readiness. Be in a state of preparedness, both for the glory and for the threat. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Don't let the fires go out. Don't let the sin that so easily besets us ease in upon you. Be ready. Be ready. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish. Five of them were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil in their lamps. And as the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry. Here's the bridegroom. Come out and meet him. All those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said, the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the, the, the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us, and you go rather to the dealers and gather some for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and they were, they were ready and went in with him to the marriage feast. And the door was shut, and afterwards the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I don't know you. All because their fires were out. Hey, come on. All because their fires are up. You see, thematically, I am not reaching into the unknown, into the mysteries, and and pulling out something that's foreign to the scriptures. I am not standing on a heretical soapbox. I am giving you an understanding straight from the scriptures. Don't let the fires go out. There are enemies. There are threats for which we must be prepared. Know this, our Lord will return without warning. We have that as a promise. Shall we in our conquest of knowing him be found unprepared? Oh, it's all good. We know him. I prayed a prayer when I was seven. We're good. Yeah. We're good. Yeah, but you got some stuff in your life, brother, that, that really doesn't look anything like Jesus. As a matter of fact, it kind of looks like the other guy. Oh, yeah. But I prayed a prayer when I was seven. We're good. No fires are out. And your territory is in jeopardy of being overtaken. Will we engorge ourselves on the comforts of our safety and find ourselves unqualified to be with him? I speak directly to us Americans. We don't know what persecution is. Somebody at school told me they were going to tell me because I prayed. It's not persecution. Persecution is having your head cut off because you confess Jesus as your Savior. Persecution is having your father beat you to death because you confess Jesus. I know people this has happened to. In our comforts here, we have become soft in our faith, and far too sensitive. The fires have dwindled on our conviction. 
We cannot afford to let this take place lest we lose our territory to the enemy. Will we engorge ourselves in the comforts of safety and find ourselves then unqualified to be with him may not be so. Keep the fires lit. Know also that our enemy, the devil, is very patient and calculated. He's not in a hurry. He's not going to come at you when there's a blaze and all is, is ready. When you're sharpening your blade and you're wearing a, a shirt that says, Dragons Beware, right? That's not when he's coming. <laughs> no, he's going to wait. Till the fires have gone down, you cannot afford to let the fires go out. You have an entity actively pursuing an opportunity to kill you. That's right. You say you sound like a conspiracist. No, I am simply a truth teller of the word of God. That's right. And God doesn't lie, though I figure I'm pretty solid on this one. He's not going to spend his time crashing against your distance as if they be strong. He's going to wait till the fires die out. Don't let the fires go out. The scriptures are not unclear when it comes to the idea of preparedness, and I would not have you unclear either. Let us not be so comfortable in our leisure that we fail. We fail to tend the fire. Friend, you cannot afford to let the fires go out. The Lord is looking for those in which the flame is kindled. What do I mean? Why, why this? This does not feel like revival. This feels like a spanking. It shouldn't. Because you're going to ask yourself this question, why should I come on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Because you need to stoke the fire. There's going to be a hundred reasons for you to miss tomorrow. Two hundred on Tuesday. And probably half of a thousand on Wednesday. You need to make the decision to be here and drag a friend with you. Tie them up if you must. <laughs> They'll forgive you. <laughs> because we've got to stoke the fire. You see, you have an enemy that wants to kill you. But I know a God that wants to rescue you. He desperately wants to see you well. And he has given us the tools, the essential tools necessary to win the day. To oppose the enemy. And to stand firmly against the threat. I want you to be here to receive understanding and clarity and instruction on how to use those tools. And long after I'm gone, you've got a godly man that fills this pulpit. Your pastor loves Jesus, and he loves you. Amen. And he's got a passion for this community. I confess that, honestly. I, I'm not a guy that tries to just say stuff. I, I, I'm saying what I see. This is a good place to learn. A good place to keep the fire going well. Long after I'm gone, you're going to have a hundred reasons that next Sunday thousand reasons the Sunday after that until you get tired of counting the reasons why you should miss church. The bass are biting, the crappie are running. <laughs> yeah. The doves are flying, the deer are waiting. The bed is calling. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have those reasons to miss, but friend, I've got to, I've got to tell you, don't let the fires go out. Don't let the fires go out. Don't let the fires go out. I want to see each and every one of you with me in eternity. Amen. I don't want anybody to burn. I really don't. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Don't let the fires go out. <coughs> and if you will stoke these fires, if you will stand ready in your faith, when the stuff that happens happens, when you get that bad scan, or you get that bad bank report, or your job falls through, or whatever, you're not going to be like, 
Going down, you're going to be like, we got this. Me and Jesus, we're together. Fire's burning. He's not forsaking me. We're going to walk through this. We're going to do this. It's going to be okay. When Satan rears his head to harm you or to lead you down a path of of unrighteousness, you're going to be able to go, not today, Satan. Not today. Amen. (laughs) Don't let the fires go out. It's so critically important that you not let the fires go out. This is the seeds of revival. Because if you can grasp a value for the investment of your time and your energy on stoking the fire of your faith, come on, then you will gain from this time of service. You will gain from these scheduled meetings. You will gain Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. As you're prepared for that day, the Lord may come and gather to himself his people. Don't let the fires go out. Young people, don't let the fires go out. Not so young people. (laughs) (laughs) It can hit you, but nobody will notice. Don't let the fires go out. (laughs) Woman of God, don't let the fires go out. Man of God, don't let the fires go out. Please. This is so critically important. The best place for you to tend the fires of your faith is in these beautifully colored pews. Amen. Here at Life Church. Under the tutelage of somebody that loves Jesus. A whole bunch. Amen. Amen. This is going to be a curious altar, but I'm going to open it for you. If you specifically need prayer, I'll be more than happy to pray with you. There was a revival that broke out in southern Arkansas. Some services were scheduled, and uh, this was a billion years ago when the Symbols of God was a young fledgling movement. My great grandmother was ordained at the First Council of the Assemblies of God, and uh, we've been. We've been inseparably attached for the good or the bad ever since. <laughs> but there was a revival that was poised to break out. Some services were scheduled in southern Arkansas. And the, the minister finished his message. And the pastor and he went out to eat afterwards. And the pastor came back to lock up the door. And when he walked in the door, he heard something. And, and the, it, some of you might remember in the old, serv- uh, the old churches, that this do in remembrance of me. Uh, thing, uh, communion table. Um, between the communion table on the, the, the step leading up to the pulpit, he, he heard a noise and he went up there and he found one of the youth, uh, actually, a young man, about 14, 15 years old, crying out to God, God, do it again. God, do it again. I've heard of what you've done in the past. I've heard of the fires of revival. Do it again. But the pastor didn't, didn't mess with him. He cheered him on and left him there, locked the door and left. The next night, they came and had another nondescript service without any extraordinary happenstance. But that evening, once again, he was in the front in between that communion table and the, the pulpit, but there was another person. Up there with him. The next night, there were two more. And the next night, it was over. (laughs) Fires of revival set in. That community, that church, would never be the same. Don't let the fires go out. But instead, find yourself saying, God, do it. Do it again. Do it again. So this altar is curious tonight in that I'm not necessarily calling for a specific need that we'll lay hands on him. <laughs> I like when God asks me to do that, but he doesn't ask me to do that very often, so you're probably safe. <laughs> I'm not calling for a specific need that we smash in Jesus' name. Rather, I'm calling for a heart condition. Mm-hmm. I'm calling for a condition in you. 
you have the honesty to say, Lord, I'm looking at my fire. And it's not good. I don't want it to go out. Just don't get angry again. Do it again. Bring that fire back. Ready my heart. I don't want to lose this territory you fought so hard for. If you join with me in that prayer, I'll be here praying with you. If you join with me in that prayer, if you, if you, if you have the honesty in your spirit to say, I need to go. <laughs> I need to pray. If your knees don't work, pray to your seat. I'm good with that. Jesus hears prayers even from the back row. I promise. <laughs> Although they're much clearer from the front row. I've heard that. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> If you can't make it to the front right there, but I'm calling you to a time of prayer tonight. That we wouldn't let the fires go out. That we would begin to invest ourselves. We would see the value in stoking that fire up once again. That fire of consecration, that fire of revival, that fire of passion, that fire, that fire of relationship with Jesus. You hear me tonight? Mm -hmm. You hear the Lord tonight? Yeah. That's my hope. Let's stand together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. I thank you for the chance once again to deliver your word and asking God that you would minister well to your people and that you would call us to a state of letting the fire be built yes, up once Jesus, again. Lord, that you would stoke within us a okay. fervor and a passion for your ways, for your heart, for your person. Tonight, God, give us a courage to begin to pursue that which we greatly seek, a revival in this church, a revival in this community, and a revival in our hearts. Many of us don't even know what that looks like, but let us, Lord, pursue with an intensity that does not let up until we have found our spirit satisfied, satisfied by your outpouring, satisfied by your goodness, satisfied by your power. In Jesus' name, begin to stoke the fire within us. I welcome you to begin to pray anywhere in this church or at this altar. This is where I'll be up here. If you need something specific, tap me on the shoulder. I'll be happy to pray with you. Thank you for your attention tonight. Find a place and pray at least for a little while. I know we've got fellowship. I know the queso dip is waiting. It'll be okay. I promise. Find a place and pray for just a minute. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, God. You can to do it. Stoking us the fire. Iria Rabarroja Shoria Yanamas.